This building, our building, at 6400 El Dorado Circle is the perfect home for the Mountain Oyster Club. Built in the 1930s, as Tucson was transitioning into an important city of the American Southwest, the daughter of a wealthy Detroit lawyer took advantage of the perfect winter climate and employed a famous New England architect to build a show place in the middle of the Sonoran Desert. The home, Stone Ashley, is approaching her 100th birthday. The story of how she got here and the men and women in her history is below. The Mountain Oyster Club has inherited a national gem and the Stone Ashley has found the perfect partner. For several winters in the early 1930s, Florence visited friends in Tucson and stayed at the El Conquistador Hotel, the Arizona Inn, and the Pioneer Hotel. Like many of us, she fell in love with Southern Arizona and decided to make it her winter home. In February of 1934, she purchased 320 acres at Wilmot and Speedway between the homes of famed writer Harold Bell Wright and the son of former FDR Treasury Secretary, William H. Wooden, Bill Wooden II. Forty acres of this half section were cultivated and refined, featuring the Italian cypress trees still standing in the drive to the Mountain Oyster Club. The home was designed by noted New York architect Grosvenor Atterbury in the Italian Renaissance style and was built by M.M. Sund Construction Company. The Sons are still members of the M.O. Club. Van der Vries Realty handled the transaction. The price of the home, $67,000. By 1936, the home, named Stone Ashley in honor of her father, was a centerpiece in Tucson society and cultural circles. In 1938, the home was featured in the December issue of House and Garden.
Grosvenor Atterbury by this time was a very famous architect who listed Rockefeller, Yale University, New York City, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art among his clients. Miss Pond certainly would have been aware of Atterbury, but evidently had not met him until he arrived in Tucson to begin design. Stone Ashley was one of Atterbury's last commissions and the only building he designed west of the Mississippi. Atterbury had worked extensively with landscapes and used famed landscape architect Rose Standish Nichols from Boston for Stone Ashley's formal gardens. Atterbury and associate John Tompkins designed a state-of-the-art cooling and irrigation system which ran throughout the property. The iron cooling tower and the fountains all played their part in cooling the house. 150 gallons of water per minute circulated through the system. Miss Pond apparently had remote controls in her bedroom on the second floor to turn this off and on. Peter Penoyer and Ann Walker, in their intelligently written and beautifully photographed book, The Architecture of Grosvenor Atterbury, provide context to Atterbury's goals when designing the home. As is often the case in Tucson, it is the sense of place that must take priority in home design. Stone Ashley was no exception. Penoyer says, while Atterbury absorbed little of the modernist influences, then beginning to permeate the profession, Stone Ashley's stripped-down rectilinear quality reflected a sensibility more so than any of his other projects. Atterbury gravitated towards a steep, sloping site. The coarse brick and stone facades and walls emphasized the house's boxy silhouette and created an appealing backdrop to the architect's gardens and fountains. A green oasis within the desert. Atterbury's landscaping included different levels of green lawns, lush plantings, orange, olive, and eucalyptus trees, an avenue of cypresses leading up to the entrance. In a sunken garden to the east, Atterbury located a cooling tower. Atterbury later said, It seemed a shame not to get some fun out of all of it, and that's why our fountains were born. A tower embellished with shapes of flowers and suns, star motifs inspired by the clear Arizona night sky, a star-shaped pool from which the water rose in jets from each of its five points. When Miss Pond died in 1955, the New York Times, in her obituary, said the home was one of the most beautiful in the region. During Florence's 11 years at Stone Ashley, she was constantly hosting events, musical, cultural, social, political, and gardening. The home was host to a children's party in 1936, the first of many in a continuing MO Club tradition. During World War II, many dances, parties, seminars, and receptions involving the military were hosted at Stone Ashley. Miss Pond kept a big staff, including a maid, a butler, cook, gardener, and two ladies' maids. The staff hailed from England, Denmark, Switzerland, Germany, and Illinois, enhancing the international flavor. European royal titles visit often. She allowed servicemen to swim at the pool twice a week and then stay for dinner. Many important people visited Florence and Tucson. Florence accompanied the famous General Pershing to the Tucson Rodeo in 1940. Evidently, a horse broke through the fence just in front of them. Thankfully, no one was hurt. No word on the horse. One story about Florence was she never slept at Stone Ashley. We don't know if this is true, but it is known she did leave the home and spent the night in downtown Tucson at the Westerner Hotel many times. Florence stood 5'4 and barely breaking 100 pounds. She was very English in her ways and had tea every afternoon. A stole she wore is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Florence decided to return to Manhattan full-time in 1947 and sold the Stone Ashley property to three New York developers. She lived out her life in New York, dying in 1955. She is buried in the Pond family plot in Detroit. The Mountain Oyster Club owes her a debt of gratitude for having the vision to build this unique and inviting property in such a remote location. John D. Rockefeller and his wife visited Tucson often. Hearing of the sale of Stone Ashley, Rockefeller toured the home designed by his good friend Grosvenor Atterbury. A reading of letters the two men exchanged in 1947 follows. 
I was impressed by the manner in which the house and grounds tied in with their wild desert mountain surroundings. And to have seen this lovely house was a great treat and inspiration. I don't wonder you enjoyed building it. You may well be proud of it. Every detail I examined with interest and appreciation. The lovely ironwork, the skillful handling of brick and stone, also the harmonious blending of the various materials. I liked especially the way the flanking buildings lose themselves in the plantings. The interior we thought most attractive and livable. The view from every window as well as every room is superb and obviously carefully planned. Your friend, John D. Rockefeller, Jr. To the most thoughtful man I know, I cannot tell you how surprised we were to hear that you and Mrs. Doctor were at Isabella's Inn in Tucson, and how delighted we were that you had run across Miss Pond. To know that three such dear friends had met warmed the cockles of our hearts, and we have been talking about it for the last three days. And only an hour ago we found your second letter telling of your visit to the house we made for her and with her. For the building of Stone Ashley was a wonderful experience, and the place owes whatever of interest, beauty, and charm you have found in it to the extraordinary degree of trust and faith she put in an architect she had never met, until the day Estelle and I stepped off the train at Tucson to see a client we had never even heard of before I received a telegram signed Florence Pond asking me to come out and advise her about a house she wanted to build in Tucson. One of the greatest rewards in the work of an architect is the transformation of a client into a dear friend and your wonderful client, Miss Pond, thus became our beloved Pondy. And we are so fond both of her and Stone Ashley that it saddens us to think of her selling it. Florence Louisa Pond was born May 1, 1867, to Ashley and Harriet Pond in Detroit, Michigan. Her father, Ashley Sr., was a prominent and successful railroad lawyer. He attended Michigan Law School, practiced with a future Supreme Court judge, and was regarded as one of Michigan's greatest lawyers. Florence had two younger siblings, Ashley Jr. and Stanley, who died young. Raised in society, she attended the Detroit Female Seminary and the Detroit Conservatory of Music. Florence became an accomplished pianist and attended the prestigious Ogant School for Young Women in Philadelphia, graduating in 1884. Her mother died in 1890 when Florence was just 22. After her mother's death, Florence traveled in Europe extensively and then relocated from Detroit to the Upper East Side of Manhattan and immersed herself in high society. She was a trustee at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, vacationed at the Briarcliff Lodge, and was always mentioned as a New York society leader in the newspapers. Florence penned an article for the Garden Club of America and was a prominent member. She was also a frequent participant at American Kennel Club shows, Caned Terriers. As many Tucsonans visit Santa Fe and Taos in northern New Mexico, her brother's story is of interest. Ashley Jr. enlisted in Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders at the beginning of the Spanish-American War, but was stricken with typhoid fever during training and had to leave the service. He moved to New Mexico for health reasons and eventually founded the boys' school in Los Alamos to serve young men with similar health problems he had experienced. The U.S. Army chose Los Alamos as the site for the Manhattan Project in World War II in part because his boys' school supplied ready-made housing for scientists. The original school buildings still stand, and of course a small body of water at the center of town is called Ashley Pond. Ashley's descendants and namesakes remain in New Mexico and are prominent physicians and writers. New York investors Arthur Bitker, Jack Taub, and David Kluger 
had visited Tucson the winter of 1947 and liked Tucson so much they returned home, sold all of their holdings, and bought the Stone Ashley with the intention to convert the property into a luxury resort. The Eldorado Lodge, as the new resort was known, was marketed in winter-weary Chicago and New York. While accommodations were southwest rustic, the food was superb. Improvements to the lodge were designed by Bernard J. Friedman and performed by M.I. Poe's construction. Forty cottages were added and a third story was added to the home. The new owners worked very hard and successfully to match the stone and brick construction of the original building for their additions. The third story was used in a, as an apartment for the Bitkers, while the second floor was available to rent. The current Catalina room was added and served as the lodge's primary dining room. Additionally, a 16-room servants' quarters was added. The lodge opened for business in 1949. These cottages, as well as six rooms in the home, were available to rent. Pricey for the times, at $110 a night with a two-week minimum, it had all the amenities and luxuries. For many, it was the first taste of the desert Southwest cowboy life. Workers remarked it was not unusual for guests to ride out on a trail ride and return in the limousine. Actor Briar, Brian Don Levy was the lodge's first paying guest in 1949. Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt attended an event in 1953. Supreme Court justices and actors were regular visitors. Author Bidker died in Las Vegas in 1975. After running the lodge successfully for 20 years, Bidker and Taub sold the property in 1968 to former Texas rodeo star Rex Nicholson and Tilton and Edna Newell. In an MO interview in 2003, Tilton said they did not change anything on the outside and it has always been a very well-run business. It was during this time the golf course, housing development, tennis courts, and country club were built. Movies were shown every night downstairs. Nicholson, in turn, sold a parcel for 40 homes to Marvin Volk's company, Marvid, in 1972. When Alan Elias purchased the Eldorado in 1973, he and his wife, Midge, evolved the hotel into a cosmopolitan and sophisticated environment, not only for winter visitors, but for Tucsonans as well. The Palm Court restaurant and the elegant, entirely new Regency room were created. The Regency room was known for its large plexiglass dome. There reportedly was a walk-in wine cellar. The hotel operated annually from mid-October to mid-April. Alan Elias, owner of the Dorado Enterprises and Marvin continued development of the property. Elias operated the country club and golf course and maintained his office on the third floor. Some employees said he was a Howard Hughes type recluse and would stay in the third floor apartment for weeks at a time. Elias sold to local investor Jerome Schull in 1975 to concentrate on his downtown projects. In 1973, the star-shaped fountain at the home's entryway, original to the Atterbury design, was filled in and planted. In 1978, a fire burned down the Regency Room restaurant, as well as the Golden Bee restaurant, which was originally built in 1973. Tilton Newell died in 2005. The building was purchased in 1979 by Jerry Schull and Associates. Charles Carr and investors Walter and Nancy Hill leased the building and the Charles restaurant was created. Carr left his job of 15 years as maitre d' at the tack room and was later joined by future wife Catherine. The restaurant had four dining rooms, the Windsor, the Wellington, the Oak, the Bethany Court, plus the Camelot Lounge, all serving fine continental cuisine. Considerable renovation occurred to restore the property to the desired state. White paint on the heavy oak ceiling beams was sandblasted away. Acoustic ceiling tile was removed. The slate floor and four fireplaces were renovated. The Charles became one of the top restaurants in Tucson. Unfortunately, in 1981, Carr and his wife left the restaurant only after two years. 
The restaurant continued in operation until 1997, welcoming Charles Carr back in 1994. Victoria Gonzalez created a modern French restaurant where the Charles had been. The Stone Ashley lasted only two years and closed in 2002. After the Stone Ashley restaurant closed, the Mountain Oyster Club purchased the property in 2003 and moved from downtown Tucson.